I'd like to review something that gets used quite a bit in calculus, and that's sigma notation. In particular, sigma notation is used to concisely write a sum. Here I have what we would say on the left side as the sum from k equals 1 to n of a sub k. And this is the same thing as a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 and so on up through adding in a sub n. So a few things to note here in terms of our um, what we call these things. So first of all, I have the letter k. And you'll see that that shows up in two places. And that's going to matter. We need to be consistent with our notation. So we refer to k here as the index. So k is the index of the summation. Then when I have a sub k, notice that that term there depends on the value of k. And we call this the kth term of the sum. We can see that there, the beneath the sigma notation, this k equals 1, that implies that uh, first value of k is 1. And then finally, the n at the top of the sum, that implies that the last value of k is n. And importantly, when we talk about the first and the last value, we're going to hit every whole number value between, in this case, 1 and n. So let's look at some examples to make sure that this is clear. So if I start off here, we can have the sum from k equals 1 to 5 of k. So to be clear, what we're finding here is that the general term is just k. So that means when I know the value of the index k, I'm going to write down that value for my term. So the first value of k is 1. So when I'm adding things, I'm going to write down the first term, which is just the value of k of 1. Then I'm going to change k to 2, in which case the term is also 2, and then 3. And I'm going to keep going until I hit the k value of 5 because of that 5 up top. Now, one of the things I want to emphasize here is that the, the letter I've chosen for my index is not important. Here, instead, you can see the index is i. I'll finish this video with just a, a caution of making sure you're consistent once you have chosen an index letter. So in this case, now we can see that my terms, and I would really refer in this case as this would be i sub e, excuse me, a sub i instead of a sub k. So here I have the sum from i equals 1 to 4 of i cubed. So again, i is going to range through 1, 2, 3, and 4. But what we do with that here is slightly different than the example above. When i is 1, the term is 1 cubed. Then when i is 2, it's 2 cubed, 3 cubed, etc. And again, I stop when I hit that final value of i. Close, but not quite the same, is instead if I have 3 raised to the index value. So 3 to the m would represent my a sub m here. And in this case, I still have four terms, and m is going to hit 1, 2, 3, and 4. But the base remains consistent here. And the first term would be 3 to the 1. The second term would be 3 squared. The third would be 3 cubed. And then finally, 3 to the fourth would be my last term. I also want to point out that these summations don't have to start at 1. Um, in this case, I have the sum from n equals 6 to 8 of n. So this is now a sub n, our general term. So the term is much like in our first example, just simply equal to the index. The difference is that the first value of that index is 6, and then 7, and then we stop at 8. And then finally, uh, here my index is r. I can see that this would be a sub r. And again, I have four terms. And so what's going to happen here is that when r is 1, we're going to get negative 1 to the first power, which is negative 1. When r is 2, negative 1 squared is positive 1. Negative 1 cubed is minus 1, and so on. And so we see here that if we were to continue this pattern, uh, anytime the index takes on an odd value, the term would be minus 1, and any time the index takes on an even value, the term would be positive 1. So one of the, the 
questions that one might have is, is why are we writing this with the sigma notation when arguably, for instance, if I look at my fourth example, six plus seven plus eight, that's not very difficult to write. And in fact, we could further just add those together to get a numerical value. Well, typically we like to use sigma notation if I have, say, a very long sum. So for instance, if I had to write out one plus two plus three, if I was gonna add all of the whole numbers from one to 100, I'm certainly not going to sit here and list out all of those numbers. So the next best thing would be to have this ellipsis notation, but it's even cleaner really to be able to just write that, for instance, as the sum of k from k equals one to 100. It's a nice consistent way of expressing that. And then what we'll see is that we often have the case where we don't even know how many terms we have in our sum. So in the example just above, we have 100. But we might want to express something like 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot 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 n, where n is some variable here. I can still write that nicely as the sum from, in this case, uh, 1 to n of general term k. And of course, in this example, I just happen to choose my general term to equal the index, but this extends to any kind of general term. The other thing I want to look at is some properties of sigma notation that we'll be able to kind of hold as, as fact as we proceed. And this first one deals with the constant multiple. So this C value, you'll note that I don't have a subscript of the index there, the implication being that this is constant with respect to the index. So if I have a constant multiple within my my summation, so part of the term, this is saying that you can take this and bring it outside of the sum. That's what we're doing here. So rather than go through a formal proof here, just to see the, the connection between these two, I'd like to just look at a, a simple example. So suppose I had the sum from k equals 1 to n of 2k. So I could interpret this as c equals 2 and a sub k is equal to k. So this is just a specific example. So this is like my starting, what I have on the left-hand side. Well, if we were to write out these terms based off of what we did above, I know this would be 2 times 1 plus 2 times 2, etc., all the way up through 2 times n. But, of course, what I can observe here is that every single term has a, a factor of 2 multiplied by it, and we can then bring that out and write this as 2 times 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 up through n. What's significant here is what I have in parentheses. I know how to express that in sigma notation from what we've done before. So I have the 2 on the outside and my parentheses there, I can express that as the sum from k equals 1 to n of k. And what we want to observe here is that I started with the first thing and what I ended up with those are the different representations of the left and the right hand side of my property above. Another property here is that if in my sigma notation, my term itself is a sum of two different things, you can express that by breaking that into two separate summations. Again, to just kind of see why this is sensible, let's look at a very particular example. And let's assume that I start with the sum from k equals one to n where my terms are k plus k squared. And again, what I can do here is actually write out the terms. So when k is 1, the term would be 1 plus 1 squared. When k is 2, it would be 2 plus 2 squared, and so on. And my final term would be n plus n squared. So now I can look at my terms and note from just properties of addition, I can rearrange these terms and I could collect all of the terms that have a power of one together. So one plus two all the way through n. And then separately join those with all of the terms that are squared. And now in these two sets of parentheses, you'll note that I have two different sums, both of which I can write in sigma notation. The first one I could express is the sum from k equals one to n of k. And the second one I could express is the sum from k equals one to n of k squared. So in this particular example, if I'm gonna liken it back to my property, k was taking on the role of a sub k and k squared was b sub k. 
And again, by equating what we started with and what we ended with, we see an example that demonstrates this property. We're writing a number two. And just the last couple things to think of, my next example here, we're asked to express a very particular sum in sigma notation. But what I want to emphasize is that there are many, many ways that we could do this. And just to list a few so we can think about that. This will come up when expressing things in sigma notation in this class. It might be that two different people both correctly write sigma notation that looks different from one another. So perhaps the most um, standard way we would do this based off of our examples above is to just simply think of general term k and just let k range from 1 to 10. This would certainly give me the desired sum. But so that's an option. But I could also think about, for instance, writing this where maybe I want k to start at 0. If k is going to start at 0, but I want the first thing that I write down to be 1, well, my term would have to be not k, but k plus 1. And similarly, if I want my last term to be 10, notice that I would need to finish my k value at 9. And much in the same way, I could write my term as, say, k minus 1 and start at 2 so that my first term is 1. And this would require me to go up to k equals 11 so that my last term is 10. So there are many ways to do this. And just to kind of keep that in mind, especially if you're kind of comparing work with someone else. And then finally, I'll end with a caution. Be, caref uh, be careful here. You want to be consistent with notation. So this really comes back to the point I made earlier where you could actually choose any letter to be the index. But it does matter that you're consistent in your choice. So to demonstrate this, Think about two different things. So if I have the sum from k equals 1 to 10 of k, we know that that is equivalent to 1 plus 2 plus all the way through 10. And if I instead wrote the sum from i equals 1 to 10, if I write i here, this is identical to what I have. So this likewise would be 1 plus 2 plus all the way through 10. So these are the same. But um, maybe I'll put it in a different color. A mistake you could imagine easily being made is I changed this to be the sum from i equals 1 to 10. But I still write k here. So the problem is that i and k, right, these don't match. So if I were to interpret this exactly as it's written, I have this k, which appears to be constant with respect to i. This tells me there are 10 things being added together. But every time I change the value of i, it has no effect whatsoever on my term. So the first term would be k, and the second term would be k, and the third term would be k. And in fact, all of my terms would be k. We know that there are 10 terms in this sum because it's from 1 to 10. So this actually just represents 10 times the constant k. And this is not equal to what I have in blue here. So it's very important that we can be careful. A very tiny error like that can drastically change what we intend to convey.